So uh, now I have the pleasure of introducing our first uh, speaker, who's Professor Nick Tyler. Uh, he is Chadwick Professor of Civil Engineering at UCL and the Director of UCL Centre for Transport Studies. He is working extensively with bodies such as Transport for London, national and local governments and civil society to help create an accessible, adaptive and sustainable urban realm, which is responsive to all people and their needs. He has recently created PAL, which is the People Environment Activity Research Laboratory, um, part of the UK National Research Facility for Infrastructure and Cities. Nick combines highly diverse fields in his research from civil engineering and architecture to neuroscience, psychology, physiology, ophthalmology, audiology, orthopedics, lighting, sound, and acoustics. Today, he is sharing a talk with us on physical distancing and social spacing, creating sociality, and clearly this is a fundamental and critical question at the moment. Um, so we're gonna go over to Nick now, um, if we can enable his uh, video and screen. Great. Um, so thank you very much for being here, Nick, and you can start um, sharing your screen. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Natasha. It's, it's such an exciting thing to be a part of, so it's really, really great to be here. It's, um, it's not letting me share my screen just at the moment, so just need to wind it up. All right. Um, okay, it's okay, we're there. I've stolen the screen. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Can't have any of this sort of social uh, sharing stuff. We have to just steal it. <laughs> okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's um, it's really great to be here, and um, I'm very sort of honoured to be the sort of first one of this new uh, to speak on this new sort of format, and, and it's a very very exciting thing. I'm very interested in in how people interact with each other, how they interact with the environment, and um, COVID has been really interesting because it's kind of for me, it's kind of sort of driven a bit of a coach and horses through the sort of ideas of proxemics that were brought out in the 1960s and have influenced urban design pretty much ever since. And it's called to sort of think hard about what we actually mean by physical distancing and social spacing um, and uh, why it's so annoying that, that you know, there's this confusion about this sort of idea of social distancing, which to me seems not something that we really want to be doing. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm very much into all of that. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how we see that at the moment and how we might try and investigate it. So the first, the first thing to bear in mind, if we want to talk about creating sociality, and um, sociality I see as kind of being able to, the feeling that you can be able to greet somebody that you don't know without any particular um, sort of hesitation about that. It's not going to let me do this better. Um, so the first thing is that if we want to do that, then if you want to have sociality, then how do you measure it? And the way one might measure it is that actually people themselves are the measure. So the way in which we would need to regard sociality is something that we can actually find out from people. And that means we have to understand people rather better perhaps than we tend to do. And that starts with how they interact with their immediate environment, the world immediately around them, the world they can see, the world they can touch. Um, and of course, also with, their, uh, with other people in that environment. So the other people are actually part of that environment. Um, so then we sort of think, well, what is this environment? And basically, well, we see the environment as sort of, sort of quadrillions of bits of information. Um, they might be pressure waves, uh, so molecules flying about in the air, they might be photons of light, they might be all sorts of things. Um, but essentially out there is data, is, is the environment essentially is all around us. And we perceive that environment by first of all, actually receiving it through our sense, sensorial systems and that through sensorial pathways like our eyes, our ears and so on. And the, we then process that, um, to one extent or the other inside uh, the brain. And then that enables us to start to perceive things. And that turns into how we start to act. So some of those actions will be driven by pre-conscious activity. We don't tend to think too much about 
how our organs are working or how our heart is working or even where our feet are when we're walking along the street having a conversation with somebody um, all of that is kind of driven in those in a sort of sense of a pre-conscious way that we're just not simply aware of but is going on all the time and only a tiny part of that is actually um, in the conscious that we are actually aware of and so we have this sort of sense of actions um, based on what's come out of the environment the data that we have perceived from the environment and of course part of the environment is us so actually we emit data to the environment so our facial gestures our body posture um, uh, for example are all signs the kind of gestures that we use with our hands the way that our face changes when we are saying something can alter its meaning all of those kinds of things become part of that environment that is then picked up by somebody else and i sort of represent this as a in, in a way as a, as a very uh, simplistic way of looking at this where you have an environment we sense that environment that's processed in the brain we perceive things we act and that action then changes the environment we then have a new environment and therefore the process repeats and we have another new environment and we have another new environment and so on so this goes on the whole time while we are actually in that environment and clearly one of the most obvious um, parts of that environment in terms of those changes are in fact our physical interaction with it and the and of late um, how far apart we are from other things and so because in a way covid um, has sort of brought this all to the fore and brought it very much into the more public um, domain uh, i thought it might be interesting to sort of have a look at some of the proxemics that was that edward hall um, devised in the 1960s to see how that was actually working and he came out with um, a number of different kinds of distance or space um, he uh, in which people interacted with each other and he categorized these he had sort of four kinds of space so the first one um, was the public space so this was up to around about none of these figures is absolutely precise but up to around about eight eight nine meters um, and that space uh, he called public space and in that space you would see a person um, you may recognize them if you know them but if you didn't you might find it hard to describe them again afterwards so recognition is possibly a little bit advanced for that distance um, uh, but you would be able to determine some kind of response is this person a threat are they not a threat for example at that kind of level so it's a kind of identifying this person as a um, somebody in the environment that you may or may not need to pay attention to as they as you come to a smaller distance he called it a social space um, in this space yes you probably will recognize a person from three meters um, you would you would be able to infer a mood much more reliably so you would know they were smiling or they were scowling um, even if the facial appearance of that might be not so far apart um, actually you, you could infer the differences from the detail at that kind of distances and that's beginning to start acknowledging somebody uh, that I'm now thinking I will want to respond to this person in some form or other and then comes a bit closer um, into the into the personal distance um, in the personal distance is where you start having conversations um, and that was about one one and a quarter meters um, apart and you can engage in a conversation and there you could start that process of chatting the fourth space the intimate space this is a space in which um, either you are very familiar with people you only allow certain people into that space um, and if somebody enters that space uh, without an invitation that actually is kind of an act of aggression so we've gone from sort of anonymity almost through recognition through engaging in conversation to um, either um, familiarity or aggression and that that kind of this kind of approach of looking at, uh, at social spacing is actually uh, has been dri driving urban design a lot in the last 40 50 years and a lot more in the last 10 or 20 years so this has been very very important and that's kind of where we've where we arrived at um, and there are some sort of various uh, things that we need to think about this um, 
that influence on urban design has been very strong. It's been taken up by a lot of urban designers, and notably people like Jan Gell and, uh, and his teams. Um, but actually, what Hall was really looking at, although he was simply recording the physical distances between people, what he was kind of recording is that those physical distances are manifestations of some form of desired social spacing. So if you take the conversation distance, the one and a quarter meters distance, for example, that is a distance at which it is comfortable to have a, a conversation because that's how your voice works, that's how your ears work, that's how your eyes work. So you can hear and speak and see the relevant gestures in detail of facial um, responses. Um, you, can you can see the differences in consonants very often between uh, between different similar sounding but um, different uh, consonants so you can identify more clearly what people are seeing at that kind of distance and it all kind of works and that we've sort of kind of accepted for the last 50 years um, but the problem is what COVID has done is it's it's kind of tied that up with um, the whole question of the social spacing and that means that we need to think a little bit more about social spacing and that's something we've been doing now for a couple of years actually and covid has just kind of brought it all um to to current notice but one of the first things is that that whereas physical distancing is very much about space social distancing is actually much more about time it's about how you can respond to people in time and um, and we can sort of think about that and we can kind of tie them together because in the end we can always link distance and time so for example that public distance if i wanted to traverse that distance it's going to take me about three to eight seconds to do that if i want to go into the social space it's going to take me somewhere between one and three seconds to get it to get across that space and um, if in the chat it's actually quite close it's just a, a second or so and so we can turn that into, into those kinds of relationships. So how long would it take to greet somebody? Remember I was saying that I saw sociality as being about the ability to, agree, to greet somebody that you didn't know. So how long does that actually take? How much out of our life does this actually take? Well, we can think about that. If you, if you saw somebody, first of all, at the extent of that public uh, space, and, they, and you and they were walking towards each other, that would actually take you about three or four seconds to do. Um, in that time, you would have gone from that identity stage to the acknowledgement stage, to the chatting stage, um, and you would have been making a lot of judgments about how that was actually going to proceed as you were doing that. And so that idea that social spacing is based on time is actually, I think, quite, an, quite important because sociality that greeting piece is actually a very much a mark of a society in which people feel free and able to make conversation with each other if they choose and that is very much part of what social spacing is about as to how we do it so that means we need to have a bit of a look at time um, so we often think that time um, is a constant many many things are measured against time um, and um, that's a kind of sort of hegemony that's been driven since, I don't know, the, when did Huygens, uh, 16th century when Huygens invented the pendulum, um, that, that kind of sense that there is a regularity about time that is a universal constant um, that, against which we can measure things. And we have been spending quite a lot of time over the past decades in reducing the time the, the time period at which we measure time so a second now is some you know millions of cycles of a cesium atom or, or whatever it is um, there's going to be a new time lords meeting in i think in a couple of years time to discover to discuss what that should be in the future and um and um, but it's always about this idea that there is this regularity about time that is it is measured but actually people do not work like that and if we're talking about social spacing and time in the sense of social spacing then we we kind of need to cast aside a bit those concepts of those highly measurable bits of time because actually what people do is that they perceive time 
and that perception of time is always moving. And the question is then, how does time move? And we were starting to think about, well, sometimes I think time rushes, sometimes I think time um, is very slow, and sometimes uh, seems to stand still maybe even. But how do we actually think of it moving? And then how does that actually equate to other things? And then I, I came across a book called um, The Clock of the Long Now. And in there, there, there is a, um, a, a sort of explanation of, of time, um, very macroscopic kind of time. And what they point out in, the, in, in there is that um, time moves in different, at different speeds, and it moves at different speeds at the same time. So if you take something like fashion, the mode of fashion, it shifts pretty quickly. You know, something that's three months old may well be out of fashion. Um, and, and it's a very, it, you know, we would perceive that as being quite a fast moving sort of idea. We talk about fast moving in terms of fashion. Um, commerce, on the other hand, tends to sit around in annual cycles. Um, I mean, businesses have to do their tax accounts every year, but, and, the, and they think, financially they talk about annual turnover they think in terms of what they can do this year in terms of business they may have a five-year business plan but um it's a bit unusual to have a company that thinks much beyond that in terms of it's the movement of time how quickly things happen um what it what it needs to take into consideration when it's making a um, a, a decision infrastructure on the other hand is more decadal so you know a railway train lasts 40 years a station maybe a hundred um, so the, the way of repetition of thinking about a new railway carriage actually is a decadal thing. The kind of trains that you see coming onto the tracks now were in conception maybe 30 or 40 years ago in some form or other. And the more recent pieces of that design might have been tweaking it, but actually um, a lot of the basics that are constraining more modern ideas are actually affected over that decadal business and the life of that carriage. It will still be around in 40 years time. And that is, of course, another reason why that infrastructural time um, feels so slow. Other infrastructure, of course, may even be longer than that. We're into the sort of era of uh, decades. Governance, if you want to change governance, governance takes a lot longer, uh, maybe centuries. Um, and uh, so changing governance in order to do something is, is a really, really slow business. Even having revolutions doesn't actually change it, change the governance that much very often. So then you move into what about culture? Well, the cultural world we live in is, has been around for probably two or 3,000 years. Um, and it hasn't really changed in the sense of the core culture. And when I'm talking about the core culture, um, here, this is, is something which moves in millennia. And uh, if you look at the whole natural world, of course, that moves in, in tens of thousands of years or hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. So if you want something to happen, it's actually quite important that you get these time cycles kind of married up so that they all work in the same time. If you want to change a fashion, but you haven't got the legal capability to do it, then your fashion probably won't change. It might flash in and out, but it won't be stable. And so we have to sort of kind of link them all up together. And in a way, COVID is quite an interesting sort of natural occurrence that is changing culture, that is changing governance, that is changing infrastructure, that is changing the way that business sees itself and is changing fashion. And it's, maybe COVID is an example of those time scales, at those time rhythms, if you like, all lining up. Um, as a very rare event. But we can look at this in a, a, a similar way of looking at time, but go the other way um, in terms of uh, people. So you could look at, um, you might want to schedule something which might be in the area of, of months uh, away, you know, and, and we might be writing things in the diary for next week, and we might be doing something which is taking an hour or two, you know, the session this afternoon is, is a few hours. Um, the action of doing something uh, may well be in more in the scale of minutes. Um, how we react to something. If you're driving a car and you see a pedestrian suddenly walk in front of you, your reaction time is measured in, in seconds or very nearly seconds. Um, on the other hand, the, the 
uh, response of your of your auditory system to a, a sound stimulus is in the order of a single figure number of milliseconds and so within ourselves we have a very different set of concepts of time that are going on and these are repeating and going around in a sort of cyclic kind of way all the time and it's actually lining all those things up and if you put those two together you end up with this sort of kind of trajectory about time where all the way across that arrow things are moving at different paces and how we actually get to do that how do we get to live with that is actually really important so we can look at it in a slightly different way um, we can see the pre-conscious conscious there's stuff going on in our in our um, mind and our brain but also as we start to make things more physical it gets into what we're doing and and how we're doing that if you look into the longer term maybe hours maybe weeks maybe heading towards months we're arranging things this thing is going to happen after that thing in a week's time and next month i'm going to do something else and then we start to predict well next year um are we going to be able to think differently about physical distancing next year well we're going to have to think about that that's a prediction that's a, a sort of sense of a bit of guesswork and a bit of logic and things if we want to think about decades and centuries you might be able to foresee that in 10 years time something will happen maybe the world will be hotter um, but actually we're getting almost to the unforeseeable when we get into the millennia and and eons kinds of paces of time so we have very different ways of thinking about these different things and in a one way of looking at that is that as you get into the longer kinds of paces of time or slower paces of time you're actually looking at more environmental things and as you're looking at the shorter ones you're looking at person thing so that all sounds fairly simple but people don't only do the physical thing which they which takes us up to sort of doing things they also of course do the thinking thing which gets them towards foreseeing things in the future so the person has a bit of a reach and a, a temporal consideration with the environment which means that we have to think about the environment a bit more um, in that way and actually our person that we saw before with their sensing sensing the environment that they're in and the environment that they're in actually contains all these time cycles at any one moment um, that is actually all changing in that cyclic way that i was describing before and that's one of the things that people do um, in the environment and that's kind of driving the way that they interact both with the environment as a as a non-person um, concept and also people and these things sort of shift around i mentioned you know, auditory stimulus processing is very much faster than visual uh, vision system processing and one of the one of the interesting results of that is that up to around about 10 meters away um, a an oral stimulus will be processed faster than a visual one and therefore your action as a response will be more responsive to the auditory uh, stimulus than it will be to the visual stimulus and the interesting thing about that if you take something like an orchestra that's how orchestras work um, musicians don't actually use visual stimulus for very much other than confirmatory things actually they are playing by ear there is their ear that is telling them when to play the note and they can sense when the next player is going to be playing something so they can synchronize with that in in very very short order and so musicians are really interesting to work with in these kinds of things because they are super sensitive to these kinds of um, issues um, however moving on the sociality idea this sense that they can greet somebody that they uh, that they don't know and actually that this is a, a wholesome experience is actually really important and it does depend on them a bit being able to process these kinds of stimuli in those kinds of time so if we go back to our arrow we can see that that sociality idea of being able to greet somebody is in the order of seconds is sort of three or four seconds as i mentioned before um, that leads into if we feel that we have the sociality that leads into the concept of lingering lingering defined as being in a space um, longer than you intended and um, that is important for us because actually that's quite a good sign that sociality is actually happening because you don't linger in a place you don't want to be so that is actually really quite important that's kind of one of the ways that you get sociality 
of three or four seconds extended into minutes, maybe even towards hours. But lingering is also uh, kind of, where do you do lingering? Well, you do it in the social space. And so the social space then becomes quite important. We're beginning to get a sort of sense of what social space is about. Um, and I think it goes, it is a sort of minutes kind of space. It might go into hours, but then it's starting to get more arranged. I think the social space is more about happenstance. So, so I think that's my own view. I think it is a more, I like to design for minutes rather than hours because hours will come out of minutes. And so we think about that social space in the sociality, but also we have this idea that all of these time paces are actually um, need to be coordinated for something to happen. And that becomes more and more important as the time scale becomes shorter. And so when we want everything to line up correctly so that we can have the sociality working in a natural environment, that actually becomes really important. And what you see is that identify moment in the social space that Edward Hall was talking about is right down in the milliseconds area. This is how we are judging that other person. We are making instantaneous almost um, assessments of that person about what they look like, how they, how, what, what their voice is like, how they are moving and so on. The acknowledgement moves into the sort of seconds area of consciousness. If we go into the chatting, we're into the sort of seconds to minutes area. And if we're going into social space, it might last a, a little bit longer. How does this actually impact on cities? Well, the impact on cities is how we create urban space. So this is a, a, an image uh, from Havana in Cuba. And in Havana, they couldn't buy concrete because um, of the sanctions. So they needed, they wanted to pedestrianize the historical center of Havana. So they needed bollards as, as ever to keep all the traffic out. Um, so they couldn't buy concrete, so they couldn't have concrete bollards, and they looked around to see what they did have. And um, what they found was lots and lots and lots of 18th century British naval bronze cannons. And um, so if you apply the law of physics to um, an 18th century British naval cannon, if you put it in the ground far enough for it to be rigid enough to be a bollard, what you're left with out of the ground makes a very convenient leaning height. And you can see a guy in the middle there leaning on this cannon. But what you're actually also looking there is there is a bunch of social spaces there. There's a bunch of people having separate conversations in groups of three or four. That comes back to the Hall's proxemics and the physiology of the eye and the ear. Um, so they are in their groups having conversations, three or four people. Um, perfectly relaxed time, maybe, I don't think anybody there is actually having a coffee or a beer, but they might have been. Um, they're certainly very relaxed. And suddenly that frontier between two administrative aspects of the city, one with cars and one without cars, is now a social space. So the frontier is no longer a barrier, it is actually a facilitator of sociality. And that's kind of created by a canon which is kind of ironic really, but if we thought about these kinds of things, so that the, the utility of that canon is to keep the traffic out, or is the utility of that canon to create the social space? I think that is a really good question for us when we're trying to think about a conscious city. We could take another example. If you look at the, the photograph on the right, um, four women having a conversation on a bench. But if you look at the four women, it looks very nice, isn't it? But you look at the four women, the two on either end actually are having quite a job to do that. They're almost sitting off the bench. And, and so having to sort of kind of hang on to the bench so that they don't fall off, it's quite a strain for them to have that conversation. And yet, undeniably, you would say this is sociality in action. They probably know each other, actually. That's fine. Um, but that is, it's that kind of social interaction that actually marks out quality of life in cities. Why is that so hard? Well, it's hard because the bench is straight. And um, so we've been looking at, well, what happens if you curve the bench? And if you look at the photograph on the left, those benches are curved. Actually, they're kind of S-shaped. And what happens is um, people sitting on the inside of the curve, like the young guys on the right, um, 
it's much easier for them to have a conversation because the curve of the bench means that they they all of the people in that group become internalized in the useful field of view um, and therefore they can all see each other very comfortably without having to move their heads all the time and things like that so they can actually communicate much much more easily and fully as a result of that than normally sitting on a straight bench um, if you sit on the outside of the bench uh, you have the opposite effect you sit on the outside you get privacy you you can do your emails or your text messaging or whatever and you can see these things actually going on the interesting thing in this particular case this was a bus station in cyprus um, when somebody new came onto the scene and asked a question they immediately went to the sort of more social internal curve side of the bench to ask something and there was immediately a response further up the bus station um, because it was, it was in the process of being um, renewed further up in the bus station were straight benches and the interesting thing about the straight benches was nobody was sitting on them but there were plenty of people standing around them but nobody was saying anything to anybody they were all doing emails and newspapers and things like that so somewhere along the line there is something about that curved bench that is actually a very very interesting marker for sociality so the question is how do we actually study this stuff how do we actually tie all this together we've talked about an awful lot of different concepts if you think about all the various bits of um, science that we have talked about this afternoon already um, how do you actually blend all those together because each one of those will be studied in detail on its own in a laboratory well how we do that is that we create an environment in which you can create those other environments and so we need to do that we need a space that is big enough that you cannot imagine the end of it and um, we can create the environment that we can control and then we can start to insert the science into there so we can analyze um, both at qualitative and quantitative levels what is actually going on in the interactions between people and the environment and we can study those things like how far apart are people but also to think about how far apart people are in time and that is what the pearl laboratory um, is actually all about so i will leave it there for you to think about thank you very much thank you so much nick that was uh absolutely amazing to sort of go through those scales of uh time and how that relates to sociality and i think seeing things like the the um canon um creating that space for lingering is very kind of um pertinent as to this, the kind of scale of detail that can go into what creates those spaces of sociality. Um, we're running over a tiny bit, um, so if, if people have questions, if they can put them into the, the chat box, um, so we could probably do one, one or two um, just before we, we move on to Kate, um, if anyone wants to put something in. Um, Otherwise, um, uh, I guess I, I've got some questions, <laughs> which, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Always, well, we'll um, um, or if any of the other panellists have as well, they're from Conscious London, um, please do jump in. Um, but uh, yeah, with I guess with the pandemic and sort of um, uh, sociality being such a, a big issue, um, have you been thinking, sort of looking at, uh, we were talking a little bit about theatres earlier, um, sort of are you looking at a whole range of different measures for different industries in terms of social space or is it particular areas or if you could just tell us a bit more about that, it would be interesting. Okay, um, I think the first thing to say, I don't have answers to it yet, but where we're asking the questions, uh, we're doing a lot of work on public transport. Um, the government has gone to extraordinary lengths to tell everybody not to use public transport um, and they have no actual evidence as to why that should be um, and and we've done a lot of work we've been doing some work redesigning buses for transport for london which has gone into action um, that's mostly to protect the drivers um, they we're now working on the passenger side of the bus um, in order to do that and we're sort of trying to think about well what makes sense if you if you it seems to be a good idea not to have people crammed in like sardines. Actually, I would have said that before COVID, 
Um, I think it's a fairly uncivilized way to travel. So, you know, actually we were trying to get away from that anyway. COVID scares people into doing that. So that's, maybe that's helpful. Um, and I think, uh, but if you want people to be less squeezed um, in a bus, for example, then I think you have to make that feel logical and good, not scared into being separate. This should be feel that it's the right distance to be. So we're looking at how that, what do people sense as being the right distance under these circumstances? What actually is the right distance? And you know, why do we want spacing? Actually, the government has no evidence for that. Um, they just think of a number, basically. Um, and, and two is two meters is sort of somewhere between one and three, um, where they think one is too small and three is unenforceable. So mm -hmm. two is a reasonable number. But actually, what does the virus think? You know, it's, it's, sort of, it's a completely different question. Um, and, and I think, so we're doing a lot of work on that. And I think that's important because actually getting people back onto public transport um, in, in, a, in a good way actually is a really good way of actually enabling people to be able to function better in the city and, and improve quality of life for everybody.